Welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you and very pleased to have on the line with us Professor Tim Snyder. He is the Levin Professor of History at Yale University, the author of several books. Uh, his most recent is On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. He's a member of the Committee of Conscience, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and a permanent fellow with the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. His website is Timothy Snyder, S N Y D E R dot org. And you can tweet him at Timothy D. Snyder. Uh, Professor Tim Snyder, welcome to the program. Glad to be here. Great to have you with us. So, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Um, uh, give, us an, give us an overview, please. Well, what I'm, what I'm starting from is the idea that there are moments in the history of a country where we all have to pay attention, and that this is one of these moments. I, I begin from the intuition that the founding fathers had, that we ought to be skeptical about ourselves, that we have to be the opposite of American exceptionalists, that we have to make sure that we're always checking ourselves against the other alternatives. The main alternative that the founding fathers were concerned about was what they called tyranny. I pick up the word from them. What I do in the book is I try to use the examples the founding fathers couldn't have used, namely the abundant failure of democratic republics in the, 200, in the 250 years or so since this country was founded. What I try to do in the book is to give us guidance from people in Europe, which is what I work on, who experience situations more drastic than ours, whether that be the rise of the far right or whether that be the rise of communism, to try to instruct us in the everyday ways, uh, the everyday practices that, that we can follow in order to make that kind of collapse less likely in our country. It seems that um, democratic republics that have at least a certain level of prosperity and stability, um, if, they, if they, they, they tend to move in one of two directions, um, one being in, in, in a direction being more egalitarian, uh, you know, the Scandinavian countries, the, the Northern European countries, um, or more, uh, for lack of a better word, libertarian, the Thatcher-Reagan experiments in the UK and the United States, um, or they flip into, as, as you mentioned, basically a hard-right authoritarianism, whether it is, whether it's, it's the form that we saw with Mussolini, Hitler, and, and uh, what's his name in Spain, uh, Franco, uh, or, or uh, you know, I, I would even submit that the, the, the communism of uh, Lenin, Stalin, et cetera, in the Soviet Union was really hard right authoritarianism, even though they called it communism. Uh, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that kind of spectrum of stuff. Well, it's a great question because it's that very spectrum. It's that wide bandwidth which history reminds us of. We can have a certain tendency in the states, whether we're on the right or whether we're on the left, to think that history really only has one channel that you know if you're on the right, you think the market generates democracy and it's all going to be stable, or if you're on the left, you think that you know, the arc of history bends towards justice. That's all nonsense, unfortunately. What history shows is that democratic republics are generally hard won, and they're also very hard to sustain. And that if one wants to keep them around, one has to know something about the histories of all of those non-democratic systems that you describe, whether it's the authoritarian uh, Catholicism of something like Franco in Spain, or whether it's the, the Bolshevism of, of the Leninists. There's a, there's a huge range of experience there, both from the point of view of the people who change regimes and from the point of view of the people who try to resist. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you about what the nature of the Leninist system was, but the important thing from the point of view of this book is that it's one alternative. It's one thing that we can learn from. And in a way, it's the learning that's really easy, because there were very intelligent people throughout the 20th century who basically threw out their messages in models for us, for people in our position, so that we would be able to learn. For example? Well, the, the book basically draws from um, the, the, the great thinkers of mid-century. So a, a good example would be a German-Jewish diarist called Victor Klimperer, who in the 1930s, um, as he was more or less stuck in his apartment, he had, a, he had a German wife, and so he could survive, chronicled how Hitler spoke. And this is, you know, in everyday life, this is sort of moderately interesting. But then when you're following the Trump campaign in 2016, it suddenly becomes spectacularly interesting because one realizes that the way that Trump spoke in, in his rallies, the repetition of, of key phrases, the demonization of opponents, the, the summons for the physical removal – of protesters were not just echoes, but, but eerie replicates of the ways that fascists functioned in public in the 1930s. Or to take an example from the other side, 
Václav Havel, the Czechoslovak dissident of the 1970s, was an extremely perceptive student of the way that everyday life matters in politics. Not because anyone cares how we feel, that's an American illusion, but because what we do matters to everyone who sees us. And so gestures, words, things that we might not think matter in a situation like now can, can turn out to be decisive. These are the kinds of thinkers that I draw on in the book. Yeah, and he was a poet. I mean, he, he, he had a, a particular insight into that. It seems like there has always been in all of these, uh, what we're referring to as democratic republics, although Jimmy Carter on this program uh, last year came on and, and said, uh, the, the United States is no longer a democracy. We are now an oligarchy ruled by unlimited political bribery as a result of law made by the Supreme Court. Um, uh, but, but it seems that the, the dynamic tension that exists in, in these um, theoretically democratic republics is between the, the constant demands of capital to uh, acquire more capital and, and more power, the power associated with it, and as Henry Wallace wrote in, in the New York Times in 1944, uh, the, uh, when the New York Times asked him about American fascists, and he said, you know, American fascists claim patriotism, but they're the spokesman for monopoly and vested interest. Um, I don't want to use the word fascist, but, but basically this dynamic tension between the ability of government to restrain the power of extraordinary capital and the force of extraordinary capital to capture and diminish the power of government. And this is this 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 tension was well known in the 30s. I mean, this is Franklin Roosevelt rode this to power talking about the economic royalists. Everybody understood this. Um, you know, my father understood this in the 50s when we would talk about this when I was a little kid. Um, but it seems like today nobody understands this because when when conservatives and I put that in quotes, say, you know, we, we want small government. Government, as FDR pointed out, is the one force that can constrain great wealth and great capital. And great wealth and great capital, if you look at if, if Italy, Spain, and Germany, for example, in the 30s, uh, in fact, I was just reading uh, Fritz Tyson's book, you know, I, I Funded Hitler. Um, great capital was behind, in many cases, these fascist movements. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And am I off base on this? Well, I mean, let me start in a slightly different way. So as a historian, I'm also obsessed with the 1930s, although in a slightly different way. I think that everybody, and especially people who call themselves conservatives, should be aware of, of the past. And in particular, be aware of the moment that you're describing, namely a moment where a great crisis, in that case a crisis of capitalism, um, made democracy seem totally implausible, basically to, to everyone people fled to the far right or do they fled to the far left the the source of hope there would be something like the american scenario where 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 roosevelt um, could think of a way that wasn't an extreme way to preserve uh, a modicum of freedom and get through the 1930s and then through the second world war looking back at it americans i think in that moment had a great deal of good luck now you're completely right about the inequality it's not that inequality leads predictably to one thing or another I mean, it can lead to a revolution from the left, it can lead to a revolution from the right, but it's absolutely true that capitalism generates inequalities that it can't handle itself. That, that is one of the major lessons of the 1930s. And so everybody who wants to maintain democracy or republics, or whatever you want to call them, has to recognize that the state has some kind of a role in regulating that. The big illusion is to think that capitalism regulates itself. That's completely wrong. And the other big illusion is to think that capitalism generates democracy. That's also completely wrong. We, we need markets in some form, in my view. But if you don't have the state present and consciously present with, with, with informed, active um, voters behind it, you're not going to end up with a democracy. It's unpredictable where it's going to lead to. But I mean, what we have now and here I'd probably agree with you much more strongly. What we have now is directly a result of inequality. If it weren't the case that Mr. Trump could stand in front of his voters and say, look, it's an oligarchy, but at least I'm your oligarch, right? That was part of his appeal. Mm -hmm. And it's understandable that people would go along with that because, as, as President Carter, I mean, unfortunately, quite rightly said, we are already drifting towards oligarchy. And so, you know, the work of American democracy can't just be a work of restoration of 2016. It also has to be a work of, of not just of repair, but of renewal. I mean, a, a democracy in America is, is, is an aspiration. We have to get through this 
and then you know reduce the role of money in politics because if if it if you can't do that then you then Trump is just going to be one bump of a whole lot of bumps in a road and eventually you'll go off the road. Yeah. And yet I've had on this program a number of libertarians including at least one politician um say uh, democracy is mob rule, democracy is a highly imperfect system, capitalism is a perfect system because it is the hive mentality. There's there's a hundred billion decisions being made every every minute by individuals who who uh, ultimately will you know you know the old Adam Smith argument. Even though Adam Smith didn't make that argument, but um, there's this there's this tendency, particularly within the Republican Party, to to actually demonize democracy, and 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 hold up capitalism as as if it were a political system when it's not, it's an economic system. What do we do about that? I, I mean, I, I think one has to, that's a good political question. I think one has to go back to the idea of the individual. I mean, for, 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 for there to be freedom, people have to grow up and become individuals. For us to become individuals, we have to have some access to things like education and health care and roads and, you know, clean air and water and so forth. The commons. In order, yeah, in order, in order, I mean, that's the paradox, right? In order to become a thinking individual, which even libertarians generally acknowledge is a good thing, you have to have so, certain social preconditions, which the baby in question cannot create, you know, he can't pull himself up by his booty straps and create that stuff. That stuff has to be somehow provided. So, you know, we can disagree about how much state there has to be, but to create the thinking individual, you have to have the state first, and that seems to me to be the basic answer to all this libertarian stuff. The other thing I wanted to say about that is that whole hive business. That's a totalitarian fantasy. You know, I don't, I don't want a hive. I don't, I don't want 99.9% .9 drones and one queen bee in the center. I want an unpredictable assemblage of American citizens who are thinking for themselves. And you just can't get that by thinking that you know the, the search for money is the is the only virtue. It motivates many good things. It makes people ambitious. But, I mean, as you already hinted, the people at the center of that tradition, Adam Smith, for example, I mean, Adam Smith very clearly said that the market requires virtues that it does not itself create. And so the work of politics to think about how one can have those virtues in the public realm. Yeah, yeah. His book, Theory of Moral Sentiments, it was all over that. Professor Tim Snyder, his new book, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Get it. Read it. Professor Snyder, thank you so much for being with us. It's been my real pleasure. Thank you. Great talk.